Hey, what's up? This is Sifu Cuddle, and in this video, I want to talk to you about the son of the guy that we all love to hate from the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and how his skills and achievements were overshadowed to fit the narrative, and most importantly, his affinity with a particular Han Dynasty weapon that made his defense so impenetrable, it was likened to him sitting within an iron dome. All in this episode of Han Dynasty Weapons. So let's start by naming the son of a gun. Cao Pi was the son of Cao Cao, who we all know as the big bad guy of Romance of the Three Kingdoms. But that's really just based on this story. In fact, Cao Cao was not a villain at all. This is not to say that everything he did is justified, but more of a reminder that uh, he did have good ideas and qualities too. In fact, for many centuries, Cao Cao was regarded as a hero in the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. However, the novel and the properties based off of the novel have all grown to take on this anti-Cao Cao flavor. The same can be said for his progeny, as we don't really hear about them except for catastrophe and scandal. So we really miss a lot about the true historical figures and their contributions to the progress through and beyond the Three Kingdoms era in Chinese history. The real Cao Pi was a warrior and a scholar. He, his father, and his brother were credited for creating their own style of poetry called Jianan poetry that departed from the typical four-syllable stanza poetry of the Han Dynasty and had five, six, or seven syllables per line. It was also a more relaxed style of prose, which eventually became more popular than the previous rigid style. Cao Pi authored hundreds of articles, many of which, including his poetry, are still taught in schools today. With that said, he was actually not the literary shining star of his family. That went to his younger brother, Cao Shi, who uh, was more favored for his artistic writings and poetries, whereas Cao Pi was known for his skills in combat and warfare. At a young age, Cao Pi took interest in combat and warfare and became very skilled in horseback riding, archery, fencing, and so on. But when it came to fighting, he was known for his exceptional skills with the Ji, or halberd. Now, if you've been following this series, you definitely know how important the Ji was in the Han Dynasty. It was such a versatile weapon and could be configured in many different ways depending on how the blade was mounted on a pole. It could be on a very long pole used for chariot warfare. It could be used as a pole arm by both the cavalry and infantry. Um, it could be used on shorter pole arms, either paired uh, together or with a shield, and could even be used as a handheld weapon, like a dagger, or even in some cases, as a throwing implement. Cao Pi favored the Di, and when he wielded two Di blades, it was said that his defense was so impenetrable, it was as if he was sitting in an iron dome. Now this is something that has stuck out to me since the very beginning, back when I was first talking to the team over at LK Chen, even before they sent these blades over to me to review. It's easy to look at a weapon and kind of figure out the, the attacking attributes of the weapon. You have the forward or the side blade, you have the forward blade, and you can kind of put together how it could have been used. But we never really consider the defensive attributes of a particular weapon. And in this case, this weapon has highlighted somebody with skill to the point where they're considered invincible. It really has to mean something. In my experience as a martial artist and in the style that I study, Choi Lei Fat, I've been able to find a companion weapon to pretty much every weapon that I've handled. And uh, this is looking at, especially for the D in, in different configurations. So when the D is mounted on a long pole uh, that could be used by the infantry or cavalry, uh, like it, we saw in the Lu Bu video, uh, it was very similar to the hook spear techniques that I have trained with, and it functioned very similar. When it comes to the short pole D, the weapon was not that distant from uh, say double axes or double hook swords. And you can see that in the Dian Wei video that I made about the Di. 
And then for the short handheld uh, Battalion D, those were very close in size and weight to a typical dagger. And you can see that in my Dong Zhuo uh, Flying D video as well. But this particular D blade, this one has really been different from the rest. I have not been able to find a companion weapon or form for this particular size and shape of a weapon. The uh, forward blade is, it's not as long as a dian and it's, it's much longer than a dagger. And the side blade extends much further out than a hatchet would and its placement closer to the hand makes a huge difference in the range of chopping techniques as well as hand protection and then just moving weight of the weapon, which makes a huge difference in its striking range and use. Needless to say, I was treading on new ground when it came to approaching this weapon. So to understand it a little bit better, I made some wooden D blades for light sparring. Now, these are pinned and glued together, which means that I couldn't go full speed or full power. And that also means that I may be missing uh, quite a bit of techniques that are possible with this weapon. However, the amount of blood and cuts and scratches and bruises can attest to how much power was used when sparring with these. In the beginning, I focused on using the forward blade like a dian for cutting and thrusting techniques and then using the side blade just for more pecking techniques. And I quickly found that I was restricting myself from the true potential of this weapon. There was so much more that could be done with this with forward punching techniques or even using this side blade for slashing. Now this was further reinforced when I took out the actual G blade and started trying out those techniques on a cutting target. But back in sparring, I found myself constantly getting tied up by my own blades, or even worse, on the receiving end of the uh, side blade. So this meant I had to modify some techniques. Rather than going in for pecking or hammering techniques, I would either have to focus on slashing and coming across to keep the side blade forward or flipping the palm and turning the blade similar to a broadsword technique. For defense, I tried to hook and pull with the side blade, but that just put my enemy's weapon dangerously close to my fingers. And in pulling in this path, it put this side blade dangerously close to my leg, risking self-inflicted injury. Now, it didn't take long for me to stop hooking with the blade and instead use the fork between the forward blade and the side blade. This may seem as an obvious option to you, especially if you've heard me mention it in other D videos, but it was this sparring that led me to this conclusion for the long weapons, long before I made those videos for Lu Bu or Dian Wei or Dong Zhuo and even this video. Once I got a handle on using the fork for defense, I really began to understand how well engineered this weapon is for both attack and defense, and really the potential it had in combat. In just a single session trying this new forked defense, I even had my own moments of an iron dome. My partner just could not break through. It was incredible. However, I was only fixated on one mode, just defense. And as good as things were, if you're not going to make an advance or try to counter, then it's only a matter of time before one cut gets in. And then overcorrections or misses lead to more attacks making their way in and eventually everything falls apart. The initial luster of the impenetrable defense had faded and I began to focus on guarded attacks and counters. This is also where the twin D can get a little bit tricky. Blade orientation is paramount because you don't want to make one blade an obstacle for attack or defense during sparring or fighting. So a simple rule is to just simply keep the, bl the side blades pointing away from each other. Now, of course, this can be broken depending on the context or the technique or the situation, but it is a solid method to begin with and a good baseline for D fighting. After all of this, I am so impressed with the twin D in combat against short sword, long sword, even double swords. 
the idea of the Iron Dome is valid, and that just makes the legend even more legendary. Knowing how accomplished Cao Pi was as a warrior and a scholar, I wouldn't be surprised how efficient he could be with the double D. No doubt he would have applied himself to not only spar, but to recount and develop new techniques and tactics in using this in the most efficient way. Now, sadly, there are no treaties or records of how these were used, but I'm confident that a weapon like this, reborn thanks to the efforts of people like LK-10, can be explored and the secrets that were once lost to time will again be revealed. I hope that this episode has given you more insight on the weapon, the techniques, and the man who was famous for using it, Cao Pi, the Iron Dome. And I also hope that it gives depth and dimension to the real people who existed over 2,000 years ago that we've caricatured over the years in books, plays, video games, television, and movies. This has been a particularly special part of my journey into history and the Han Dynasty. I never thought I would be so challenged by a single weapon. And even after making four videos about a single blade, there is still so much that I've learned and I know that I will learn. So I really need to send a huge thanks to LK10, KK, and the rest of the team, not only for sending me these blades to work with, but being a huge resource for me on the history and Chinese culture and a way to put things together because without them, I wouldn't have much to say in these videos. And I've learned a lot and I've tried to share all of that and it just wouldn't have been made possible without their efforts. Now, if you're interested in this particular blade, you can find it on LK Chen's website. There are actually two sizes of G and this one is called the Combat G, which is the larger of the two. Now, I actually wrapped the handle with leather, and if you're going to do that, it's very important that you use the hole right here to wrap first through. This is because the blade itself tapers down, so if you're swinging the blade around, the grip may start to slide off. So if you have this wrapped and secured here, underneath the rest of your wrap, it will keep it from sliding. I would also suggest if this is going to be the style of G that you are going to carry, that you either use some kind of an adhesive or tape to keep it secure to the blade. That way you don't have to worry about any kind of slippage. Uh, you could place painter's tape over the blade and then glue the leather to that or your grip to that. And that would also be another method as well. Now, I'll be leaving a link in the description down below, as well as a little bit of uh, one of these cards up here. So you can hop on over to LK10 and check it out on the website and uh, pick one up for yourself. As always, if you have one of these blades or if you have any questions or comments, drop it down in the comments below. I'll answer if I can, or if you have a blade and you just wanna share your thoughts on it or answer somebody's questions, please feel free to do that too. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video and I hope you've been enjoying this series, uh, Han Dynasty Weapons, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.